Now I'd like to introduce our moderator, the Honorable Greg Ka Gregory Katsas, goes by Greg, U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Judge Katsas was appointed to the D.C. Circuit in December 2017. He graduated from Princeton University and Harvard Law School, where he was an executive editor on the Harvard Law Review. Between 1989 and 1992, he served as a law clerk to Judge Edward Becker on the Third Circuit, to then Judge Clarence Thomas on the D.C. Circuit, and to Justice Thomas on the Supreme Court. Between 1992 and 2001, he was an associate and then partner in the Washington office of Jones Day, where he specialized in appellate and complex litigation. Between 2001 and 2009, he served in many senior positions in the Department of Justice, including as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Division and as Acting Associate Attorney General. In 2009, he returned to Jones Day. From January to December 2017, he served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy Counsel to the, to the President. Judge Katzis, thank you. Thank, thank. thank you, Jack. Uh, the subject of today's panel is law school accreditation standards, and more specifically, the diversity and curricular standards that have been proposed by the American Bar Association's section on legal education and admission to the bar. ABA accreditation standards have the force and effect of law. They, uh, the Department of Education uses them for federal law purposes, and most states require graduation from an ABA accredited law school in order to practice law. We're gonna focus on amendments uh, to the accreditation standards that were recently proposed by the Council on Legal Education uh, they're fairly detailed, but just to tee things up, I, I will mention three aspects of the proposals. One is to broaden the existing di diversity requirements. Uh, the current standard requires law schools to undertake concrete action to produce a student body that is diverse with respect to race, ethnicity, and gender. The proposal on the table uh, would broaden both the kinds of actions required and the kinds of diversity required. Um, it is to require effective action showing progress in diversification, and it defines diversity with respect to uh, race, color, ethnicity, national origin, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, disability, religion, and military status. The proposal would measure compliance by reference to results achieved uh, and provides no excuse uh, for noncompliance to the extent that federal or state law bars discrimination on any of these um, grounds. The second um, element of the proposal is to require effective action to produce an environment um, that is inclusive and equitable with respect to the same categories. Um, the proposal outlines possible ways to achieve this, including suggestions like tracking academic outcomes by race, sex, et cetera, supporting affinity groups, and providing diversity, equity, and inclusion training. And as with the student body provision, it states that compliance is measured by outcomes achieved. Third, uh, proposed proposal is to amend the curricular requirements. Uh, the current standard requires courses on professional responsibility, a course on clinical training, and exposure to legal writing. The proposal on the table is to add required training with respect to bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism. Um, the original proposal from, I think it was April of 2021, generated a fair amount of opposition, uh, some from quarters one might expect, like conservative-leaning groups such as the Justice Liberty Center and FIRE, um, raising concerns about 
reverse discrimination, free speech, and religious liberty. Um, there was also opposition from 10 prominent members of the Yale Law School faculty, including Professor Amar, who's at this conference. Um, the Yale professors worried that the expanded diversity requirements were a euphemism for quotas and an incitement to violate anti-discrimination law. Uh, they raised a concern that affinity groups um, are by definition non-diverse, so there's room for good faith disagreement about whether expanded support for them is a good thing or a bad thing. And they suggested that some of the diversity initiatives were unnecessary because in their words, American law schools today are hotbeds of concern and activity to promote diversity. Uh, the original standards were tabled, um, uh, subject to further review. Just the other day, a, a new set of proposals came out from the ABA. Um, I, I just found out about them about an hour ago, so I haven't had a chance to study them, um, but hopefully our panelists will educate me as they educate you on um, how the ABA has changed the original amendments, where they might be going with this, and maybe we'll have some debate on the pros and cons of this as well. I will introduce the, um, our very distinguished panel in the order in which they will be making opening statements. So. Uh, Thomas Morgan is the Oppenheim Professor Emeritus of Antitrust and Trade Regulation Law at the George Washington University Law School, where he teaches antitrust and professional responsibility. He's written widely used casebooks about both subjects, as well as articles about legal education. Professor Morgan helped draft both the restatement of law governing lawyers and the model rules of professional conduct. He served as Dean of the Emory Law School and has taught at Brigham Young, Cornell, and the University of Illinois. Scott Bales served on the Arizona Supreme Court for 14 years, including as its Chief Justice for five years. From 2020 to 2021, Justice Bales was Chairman of the Council of the ABA's Section on Legal Education when the accreditation standards at issue here were first rolled out. Earlier in his career, he served as a law clerk to Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in what is now the Justice Department's Office of Legal Policy, and as the Solicitor General of Arizona. John McGinnis is the George C. Dix Professor of Constitutional Law at Northwestern University Pritzker School of Law. He's written dozens of scholarly books and articles, including Originalism and the Good Constitution, which was published by the Harvard University Press in 2013. He served as a law clerk for then Judge Ken Starr on the DC Circuit, and as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the DOJ's Office of Legal Counsel. In 1997, he received the Fed Sox Bachelor Award, which is given to an outstanding academic under age 40. Daniel Thies is a shareholder in the firm of Weber and Thies. He serves with Justice Bales on the Council of the ABA's Section on Legal Education. In private practice, he handles complex commercial dis disputes throughout the country. He began his career as a law clerk to Judge James Holderman, of the Northern District of Illinois, and to Judge Jerry Smith on the Fifth Circuit. Uh, we'll begin with opening statements of um, up to 10 minutes, so let me turn the floor over to Professor Morgan. Thank you, Judge Katsas. To most law schools, <clears throat> national accreditation is a matter of life or death. Law students and prospective clients, in turn, depend on accreditation standards to require what will help the law schools produce informed and effective lawyers. Who has the power to accredit law schools, shapes what gets taught, by whom, and to whom. Ultimately, the holder of accreditation authority shapes the development of law itself. 
I'm here this morning to provide a little background. I am not an opponent of the ABA. Indeed, I think I'm a friend. I've been a member of the ABA for over 50 years. I've chaired many site visits in support of the accreditation process. But the ABA today is in somewhat disarray and the independence of the law school accreditation function is in sufficient doubt to make today's program timely. The ABA began in 1878 as a, essentially a 100-member in, invitation-only club of outstanding lawyers. Even then, legal education was one of its main interests. The move from small club to national big tent for the legal profession was achieved in the 1930s when the ABA welcomed state and local bar association, associations to participate in its policymaking uh, meetings. After World War II, the ABA articulated six organization objectives, including preservation of and education about the Constitution and the constitutional system of government, finding ways to make legal services available, to everyone at a cost they can afford, and finishing up with coordination of the activities of the entire U.S. organized bar. <laughs> the ABA organized itself internally to support subject matter sections that attracted many of my generation to join it for the chance to mingle with leaders in our fields and to try to make constructive changes in the law. In 1952, the Justice Department agreed to let the ABA comment on qualifications of judicial nominees. And the same year, the US Department of Education empowered the ABA to accredit law schools. So far, so good. But throughout the mid 20th century, the ABA pursued another preoccupation. And I'm not making this up. The preoccupation was how can we guarantee that lawyers earn as much as doctors? <laughs> that was a, a kind of a, a good objective to, uh, <laughs> to many, uh, many young lawyers who had returned from World War II and, and were trying to rebuild their careers. Doctors make it hard to become a doctor, the argument went and we too should try to limit entry into our field. <laughs> Ultimately, a Justice Department antitrust case uh, alleged capture of the accreditation process by practicing lawyers and law school faculty. It was settlement of the accreditation case in uh, 1995 that put the standards themselves and their application to particular schools almost entirely in the hands of the Council of the ABA Section of Legal Education and Admission to the Bar. Uh, Scott Bales and Daniel Thies will uh, embody for you the fact that that group has had very able and, and distinguished uh, members over the years. Uh, the delegation of accreditation authority to the Council was explicitly made to cut the tie between law school accreditation and the ABA. The ABA's decline and disarray as a result today can be seen in numbers. In 1980, the ABA had about 300,000 members, which at the time was well over 50% of American lawyers. By now, membership is down below 200,000. Now, only about one in seven U.S. lawyers is a member of the ABA. In the process, the old ABA goals of preserving our system of government, public education about the Constitution, and promoting ways to make affordable legal uh, services available to all citizens are largely gone. Since about 2008, the ABA goals 
are focused on four principles. Goal one, member services, includes CLE programs and section activities, which many of you may uh, be involved in, plus car rental and product discounts designed to make economic sense of being an ABA member. Goal two, advocacy for the profession, supports the ABA's involvement here in Washington, advocating a, a number of uh, ABA objectives. Uh, goal four, advancing the rule of law, is a continuation of a longstanding program called uh, World Peace Through Law. But goal three, which is the one we're focusing on, on eliminating bias and enhancing diversity is basically the only substantive goal the ABA has left. What the ABA calls its goal three business unit, the Diversity and Inclusion Center, has nine so-called goal three entities, each churning out policies and standards. I give you this background because we're here today looking at the impact of goal three on law school accreditation. And I submit that cutting the tie between the ABA and the Council of the Section of Legal Education seems basically not to have happened or not to have happened uh, to a sufficient uh, degree. Proposals to amend accreditation standards in the name of diversifying law schools, uh, faculties and student bodies are closely derived from the ABA's strategy for furthering goal three objectives. For example, the proposal Judge Katz has described uh, with respect to accreditation standard 206 requiring uh, uh, affirmative efforts to improve uh, diversity uh, is basic, basically tracks the goal three survey of uh, uh, members and uh, uh, leaders in the ABA uh, that uh, uh, has been uh, undertaken lately. It requires a survey of law school and students, race, ethnicity, and even their self, uh, sexual self-identity, uh, a variety of factors, and then is intended to use that data as a basis for monitoring and uh, for future uh, law school hiring and admission decisions. Of course, none of us should forget that law schools, like the remainder of our society, faces the consequences of wrongs done to black citizens and others over now many generations. That's a problem of profound concern and it isn't going to go away without a lot of sensitivity and effort. Having a diverse bar is a good objective, but as Judge Katz, Katz recited uh, earlier, it is a current objective of the council without the kinds of changes that uh, are now being proposed. We need to recognize that the council is under a lot of pressure from others in the educational world who favor very much the objectives that uh, they have been advancing. Uh, and it is trying to talk through those issues that I think we're gonna do uh, today. Of course, the ABA is as much a private club uh, as it was in 1876, 1878. And as such, it can do what it wants with its goals and it will live with the result of its efforts. Law schools, however, have to live in a competitive, a challenging world. They have to recruit uh, good faculty and good students uh, and in addition to worrying about their uh, uh, racial and ethnic and other characteristics, uh, they have to figure out how to operate at lower cost, 
charge lower tuition and graduate students with less debt who st uh, still uh, will be informed, courageous professionals throughout their career. The current administration's Department of Education has given the Council uh, of the ABA section a new five-year term as a creditor of American law schools. The current administration likes what they see. I would hope that the Council will assert its independence and focus on a balanced set of objectives that reflect the real world that law schools experience and could get wide support throughout the bar and the law school communities. If present trends continue, however, in my opinion, the Council of the ABA section uh, should one day lose its status as the accreditation authority for American law schools. Thank you. Justice Bales. Thank you. Um, I want to begin by thanking Judge Katsas and the organizers for putting this panel together and uh, noting a perhaps uh, unrecognized connection between the panel and legal education. As it ends up, Professor McGinnis and I were classmates, and uh, after we graduated from law school, we both worked uh, the following summer in the office of the U.S. Solicitor General, so that was 1983. And for me, that resulted because one of my mentors in law school was Paul Bator, who had gone on to become a Deputy Solicitor General. And uh, I, was, I was pleased to learn in preparing for the panel that among the recipients of the Paul Bator Teaching Award is Professor McGinnis. Of course, uh, Professor Bator was one of the faculty members involved in the early uh, formation of the Federalist Society. So um, for me, it's a, it's a privilege to be here to talk with you for that, among other reasons. I'm going to talk about why um, I think accreditation by the ABA's consul is a positive force, and in the course of doing that, try to explain a little bit about how the consul differs from the ABA on a larger scale, and perhaps as a prelude to some of the comments that Daniel's going to make, talk a little bit about why diversity in our profession is so important in today's world. Um, it's, it's easy for people to conflate the ABA in the sense of its uh, role as a professional association with, as, as Professor Morgan noted, hundreds of thousands of members. It's easy to conflate that with the ABA's counsel for the section of legal education, but it's important to understand that the ABA as the bigger entity doesn't really play a role in the accreditation process. Um, and actually that is a consequence of, of federal law. The consul has to act separately and independently from the larger ABA in, in its role as an accreditor. So the decisions whether to accredit a particular school, whether a school is found to have be out of compliance, the articulation of the standards and the rules that govern that process. Those are done by the consul without participation by, for example, the Board of Governors of the ABA or the larger House of Delegates. With respect to the adoption of standards, um, the House of Delegates has a, a small role in the sense that when we, the consul, approve a change in the standards, um, that is sent to the House of Delegates for its concurrence, and it has the ability to refer back to the Consul twice a proposal before it becomes effective. So, for example, when the Consul in the last couple years approved a more rigorous standard for bar passage, that was initially referred back for further consideration by the um, House of Delegates, but ultimately the Consul chose to proceed um, notwithstanding the referral, an illustration, I guess, of the kind of independence that Professor Morgan thinks is, is valuable on the part of, of the consul. So you may be wondering, well, who is this consul if it's actually separate and independent from the larger ABA? It's, it's 20 people, um, and less than half of the 20 are people actually associated with law schools. So 
There currently, I think, um, of the 20 members, there are nine law faculty or deans of the nine, six are current or former deans of law schools. Um, of the remaining 11, seven are um, people who are lawyers or judges like Daniel and me and um, the other members include the Chief Justice of Michigan and um, the Chief Judge of the D.C. Court of Appeals is I believe what your highest local court is called. And um, there are four non-lawyer members um, that come from different backgrounds. For example, there's a professor of architecture from Oregon who's on actually the board of accreditation for architects. So it's, it's by design a, a cross-section of people with uh, both interest in the accreditation process and relevant experience, but also by design not dominated by people currently working as law deans or professors. Um, accreditation serves three important functions. Um, First, and, and this ties into what Professor Morgan said a little bit about the economics of legal education, by, by being accredited, a school's students are eligible for federal student aid. So that's a function of the Department of Education. It's, it's been in place for some 70 years uh, because understandably, you don't want to have federally funded student loans going to institutions that are bringing in students and then graduating them in ways that leave them incapable of um, practicing or repaying their loans. Second important function of accreditation is, is it does allow a, a law graduate to then go to literally every state, the District of Columbia and some of our other um, U.S. territories or possessions and, and qualify for admission. It's accepted across our multiple jurisdictions. And with a federalist system, that's very important because the admission to practice is, is regulated at the level of states, almost exclusively by state supreme courts. The ABA doesn't determine who can practice law. That's done by individual jurisdictions, state supreme courts. So if a, if a law student like me, when I was finishing, is going to go and try to practice in a state on the other side of the country from where I went to law school, it's important that there be a uniform recognition. Um, that has a lot of benefits for, for law students and, and for the legal profession. And then third, accreditation is something of a signaling uh, device. It, it signifies to students who are contemplating going to law school, to employers who are hiring graduates from law schools, that they have achieved a certain level of um, identified um, minimal studies that, that serve, we hope, to qualify people for admission to the bar and success in practice. So one thing that means, those, those multiple functions, is the council has multiple constituencies. Um, we we're uh, quite responsive to the Department of Education. Um, we have to be if we're going to remain the recognized accreditor. We are responsive or we try to be responsive to what we understand to be the needs of, of students in terms of actually getting educations that will prepare them for admission and successful practice. And we're also um, appropriately sensitive to what we hear from state supreme courts now that by no means exhausts the constituencies. Uh, we hear a lot and often from deans and others involved with um, actually legal education in different roles. And what, one thing it I think reminds me of that it's important <laughs> to not forget is when you're talking about organizations like the Consul or perhaps more broadly even the ABA, um, you have to avoid the danger of anthropomorphizing, um, of attributing to complicated entities um, sort of the type of design or deliberation or choice that an individual may have. Um, in my experience, that is, is rarely true with respect to the council, at least, and certainly with respect to the ABA. So um, the standards, as you might expect, are complicated given that they're drafted um, by a, a committee and given that they govern the activities of what in essence are lawyers. Um, but they are fluid and they're adopted in ways that involve a lot of um, input from the different groups I've identified. Um, 
as, as I think the remarks by both Judge Katsas and Judge or Professor Morgan reflect, that the changes we're going to talk about in the course of this program um, were initially um, consideration began in 2020. There was public notice at a certain stage. That then has led to further consideration. Um, and the, the council doesn't do anything precipitously, which I sometimes think is perhaps a handicap. It certainly doesn't do anything at the behest of the leadership of the ABA, again, in the sense of the ABA president or the ABA council. Um, we are continually trying to make sure the standards reflect the current um, needs and changes in, in the way education is provided and the needs of the profession. You know, one illustration is that once the pandemic occurred, um, law schools, like other institutions and certainly other institutions of higher education, had to pivot almost immediately from in-person education to virtual education. And the standards, by and large, restrict law schools more, more so than other um, higher education programs in terms of the amount of distance education they can offer. So we had to go uh, literally within a matter of months uh, to uh, almost entirely online education, and, and that was something that we achieved successfully, which is um, reflective of both work by the council, but even more so by uh, law schools and their students and faculties. Um, longer term, we're, we're looking currently at what the regulations on distance education should be. We um, have also improved the processes in various ways. Law schools get accredited every 10 years through a pretty rigorous process, but in the interim, they, they file annual reports on things like changes in enrollment, um, employment of graduates, attrition, and the, and the councils become much more um, agile in terms of responding to that kind of information and trying to then follow up and make sure schools are keeping on track in terms of compliance with the standards. So in, in just a few minutes before I finish, I'm going to comment briefly on why diversity in our profession I think is so important, particularly from the perspective of preserving confidence in our legal system and, and the rule of law. So if you look at the census data that came out last spring, Diversity index in the United States is now over 60%. That means if you pick two people by random, the chances that they're going to be from different racial or ethnic backgrounds is now almost two-thirds. Significant increase since 2010. Census data also showed that almost half of the children in the United States are diverse in terms of race or ethnicity. A quarter of the children in the United States have one immigrant parent, which I thought was a stunning statistic, and then I realized, well, my daughter-in-law has an immigrant parent. Um, and that diversity is only increasing. At the same time, we know from various surveys that among particularly minority communities, confidence in our justice system broadly has been declining. And this was true even before the incidents um, of the summer of 2020, such as the murder of George Floyd. We also know that over the last decade, diversity in the legal profession has stagnated. About 15% of American lawyers are diverse in terms of ethnicity or race. Now, we're, we're doing better in terms of diversity by gender, the, the percentage of practicing lawyers who identify as women have increased from about a third to 37 percent. And we certainly do better in diversity in our law schools and, and among law faculties, but even there it's, it's still relatively much less diverse than our current population or where our population is trending. Um, I, I very much believe in um, the goals of increasing diversity among our profession. Um, I don't see it, I, I see it more from the perspective of a, a former state chief justice in a very diverse state and wanting to ensure that there is widespread faith and support for the ideals of the rule of law that led me to want to become a lawyer in the first place. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that and about whether the um, pending proposals for changes in the standards advance those goals or not. And again, I'm 
thank the organizers for putting this panel together. Pastor McGinnis. Yes, well, well, thank you so much, and thanks to the section for inviting me, and I'm really very pleased to be uh, with my old uh, classmate, uh, uh, Scott Bales, t today. He had a reputation as a very judicious uh, fellow, even as a law student, which is, which is rare. Uh, so I'm afraid that I, though, find that new standards uh, uh, of the section on legal education, I think they are substantively flawed, and I think they impose unwise, and I, in my view, sometimes illegal requirements on schools to consider such matters as race and ethnicity and file, faculty hiring and admission. Uh, and they more generally, I think, encourage a trend that's already going on in our law schools, a trend towards uh, wokeness and uh, uh, illiberalism. But even if I like the substantive standards, I would still object largely to their imposition because these are ideologically freighted requirements on all school law schools, and therefore they retard what I think is really important about legal education, the ability to experiment and innovate by individual law schools and not to follow the crowd. So let's, as an example, begin with section standards 206, strengthen requirement of a diverse faculty where diversity is defined entirely in terms of demographic characteristics. It gives pride of place, gives real focus to diversity with respect to race, ethnic uh, uh, diversity. And uh, otherwise, I think, uh, uh, and I think that standard will sometimes, perhaps often, require race and ethnic gender consciousness in hiring. Otherwise, a faculty would find it impossible, I think, to satisfy it at particular times given the competing demands of course coverage and scholarship that traditionally dominate faculty hiring and the selection. Moreover, the council, I think, makes it clear that a school may need to consider such characteristics because it exempts only state laws, state, uh, state uh, uh, schools, in jurisdictions that um, actually forbid consideration of race and ethnicity and gender from being, com might, from being compelled to do so if they don't have a diverse faculty. I think this blanket requirement is illegal. The legality of affirmative action and employment plans hinge on a particular institution's determination about past discrimination in hiring minority groups. Uh, most law schools have been hiring without discrimination for more than a generation or more. Moreover, there has never been a Supreme Court ruling to extend the diversity rationale of Grutter to employment, let alone to faculty hiring where considerations in favor of non-discrimination are even weightier. And in any event, the justification for Grutter's diversity rationale depends heavily on the academic freedom of uh, universities to make their own decisions about the need for such diversity. The one-size-fits-all mandate undermines rather than advances the academic freedom of law schools, which I think is an underpinning of the Grutter decisions. And I think even if these requirements were legal, they'd be unwise, certainly without a concomitant requirement to assure intellectual diversity, because let's look at the effects of the standards on intellectual diversity. Frankly, at the moment, uh, as the Anglican Church was said to be the Tory party at prayer, law professors today are the Democratic party at the lectern. A recent study by political scientists at Harvard and Chicago shows that at many schools there are almost no representatives of conservative views among the faculty. And the authors themselves noted minority and female professors are even more left-wing on average than the median professor, creating an enormous tension between a push for diversity defined by demographic characteristics and the viewpoint diversity which some schools might well think is the real diversity that's needed at a law school, given that law consists of uh, a lot about policy debates. Indeed, I fear that the standards indifference to viewpoint diversity suggests that the section is actually not interested in promoting what most people would think of as diversity per se, but only racial and ethnic balancing. The blunt effect of the section uh, on legal education standards is likely to have everyone singing from the same political hymnal so long as they look different. And what is the justification, and what is the justification for an accreditation agency imposing this standards on all law schools? 
Is there any study that shows that focusing on the demographic characteristics and hiring results in a better education for students, students of all races and ethnicities, than evaluating individuals solely on teaching and their scholarly achievements? I have similar concerns about sections 206 imposition of similar, if slightly more weakly worded diversity requirements, again, I think, defined entirely by demographic group identity in the student body. Now, uh, even if sharing uh, the interest in having uh, a profession that's open uh, to all ethnic uh, groups, we do, however, have substantial data suggesting that admitting uh, some racial minorities with substantially lower credentials than other students weakens their performance at the bar compared to students with the same credentials who go to a school uh, with students of the same caliber. So there's still a, there's an empirical question even about how to best diversify uh, the profession. Uh, uh, to be sure, there's a debate about what has been called the mismatch uh, hypothesis. But it shouldn't be the role of an accreditor to prevent schools from acting on their own view of the relevant evidence and not giving a substantial preference uh, on admission uh, based on minority status, precisely because of their fear that this will not advance uh, those people who are admitted as opposed to going to a school uh, where the students are of similar scores and grade point averages. Standard 206 also requires that school maintain an equitable and inclusive environment and report each year what they've done about it. Now, anyone, I think, equity and inclusion are undefined by these standards, but anyone on campus today recognize that these are words that have become words of woke speak that can justify all sorts of ideas that, w that anyone, an average person, I think might think, well, inequitable and non-inclusive, such as skewing benefits to particular groups. And let me not say that this is just an abstract concern. Uh, uh, this fall, I heard uh, uh, a diversity uh, consultant uh, at our law school uh, say the following, saying that cold calling everyone via the time-honored Socratic method was non-inclusive. You might think it's the, uh, it's, it is completely inclusive. You call on everyone, you grill everyone, because the Socratic method makes some students more uncomfortable than others. And, <laughs> and, she, and the, this consultant also suggested that we have in every class, no matter what its subject matter, an acknowledgment of the history of white supremacy. And quite a few schools have decided, and you can look at their websites, the Loyola Chicago is a prominent one, I'm sorry to say in my, in my own jurisdiction, have decided that to be inclusive they must proclaim themselves to be, quote, anti-racist, a frequently now Orwellian term, and even require prospective faculty hires to say how they will advance such ideological goals. The standards give no indication that these kinds of changes may not be required to create an inclusive and equitable environment. The standards only say that law schools are not required to censor or prohibit academic discussion by faculty of ideas that may be offensive. I find that hardly comforting. The standards don't require crushing academic freedom in the name of wokeness, but they don't forbid it either. Anyone in law school, school campus knows that these standards will encourage administrators to make their institutions more woke to avoid potential trouble at accreditation time, particularly giving, given the reality that accreditation visit committees are likely composed, are often composed, of relatively liberal, even left-wing faculty members. A new provision in Standard 303 also requires that law schools shall provide training and education to law students on bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism at the start of the program of legal education at least once again before graduation. This requirement breaks new ground by telling law schools what is the, is the, so, what is the clear, the most important social problem related to the profession, so important that it must be addressed not directly in any subject related to law. As a group of senior law professor, Yale law professors said, and then not a single conservative among these professors, and that's not surprising, it's Yale after all, <laughs> uh, uh, they said that these, uh, they, they understood the reality of these uh, standards. They said that the new proposed requirements, these educational requirements, attempt to institutionalize dogma, mandating instruction in matters that are unrelated to any distinctively le legal skill. 
So the common theme of these problematic provisions is they represent ideologically left-wing efforts to impose uniformity on the nation's law school without evidence that they will improve attorneys' skills or their fidelity to law. So let's just look at them. The left favors race and gender consciousness in hiring, whereas colorblindness is the predominant position of the right and Republicans. The standards are concerned with demographic diversity to the exclusion, indeed to the detriment, of ideological diversity. That's also the position of the left. The idea, and I think this is represented in, their, in the standards about what needs to be taught, that structural racism rather than structural elite self-dealing that hurts the working class regardless of race, that that's the besetting problem of American society, I think also encapsulates nicely a fundamental difference between the right and the left. Uh, Judge Bales argues that the committee, that the Council on Legal Education is independent uh, from the ABA, and as, of course, as uh, Professor Morgan has suggested, there seems to be a clear connection between its drive and the ABA's uh, now uh, uh, central uh, focus. But I think more generally, it's hard to believe that it's not diffusely influenced by the political attitudes of the American Bar Association. I believe it's Head, maybe we be corrected, its head is appointed by the ABA president. It's many of its members, I think most of its members are, are ABA members. And frankly, the ABA has become a left-wing organization. The resolutions at the ABA's annual meeting now resemble a wish list of the Democratic Party. Let's just look at a few of recent ones. Voting rights for the incarcerated, a minimum wage, abortion rights, Prohib prohibiting, uh, 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 prohibition on preventing biologically uh, male athletes, uh, from, biologically male athletes from competing in women's sports, to name just a few. These are all controversial ideological positions. To be sure, some individual members of the ABA, including my distinguished colleagues on this panel, I'm sure have the best of motives. Even if not being academics, I'm not sure they're fully alive to all the realities of how their language will affect the campus. But the structural realities, I think, of ideological influence can't be ignored. Let's have a thought experiment. Let's think that we had a structure, uh, we had the accrediting body, we had a structure, a uh, council on legal education that was connected, as the ABA is, but not the ABA, but to the Federalist Society. And let's assume uh, that uh, it had, was said to be independent of the Federalist Society, but had mostly members of the Federalist Society who also, I think, undoubtedly have the best of motives. Despite their equal, their excellent motivation and the characters of the individual members, and despite the fact that, unlike the ABA, the Federalist Society does not take ideological positions, despite that, I think people would be worried about the influence of the Federalist Society on this supposedly independent council uh, that was in some way connected to it. Thus, I think just as the previous administration wisely took out the ABA's standing committee on, judicial, on the judiciary out of its privileged position in judging judicial candidates, so should the Education Department deprive uh, the ABA and its, uh, the council of its position as an accrediting body. After all, the reason for the education, <laughs> after all, the reason for the education department's involvement, I think, principally, is to determine what institutions are likely to graduate students who will repay their student loans. That's the federal interest. <laughs> but these new requirements have nothing to do with this interest which would be better served, in my view, by simply reviewing the loan default rates at various schools. <laughs> in the interim, states, uh, states can consider removing uh, the uh, influence of the council from the processing of accrediting law schools. I think that change would lead to more experimentation and innovation in legal education, in including innovation of how, actually, uh, to diversify the profession free from the ideological straitjacket of the current association standards. Thanks very much. Mr. Thies. Uh, thank you, Judge Katsas, and thank you to everybody for attending and to the organizers as well for this program.
I want to start out by mentioning another connection uh, on the panel, which is that Professor Morgan, during his time in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, became good friends with my, my grandfather, my, some of my uncles, and, and a number of my family members. So all of them speak very highly of him, uh, and it's an honor to be on a panel with him. Uh, I also attended these uh, National Lawyers Conventions as a law student, uh, now a little bit over a decade ago, and I always also remember being very impressed by Professor McGinnis and uh, his very cogent and witty positions on a number of things, so it's also an honor to be up here with him. Um, it's fallen to me uh, to defend the ABA's diversity proposals, uh, and I think it's useful to point out that, uh, handicap as it is, we're actually in the middle of the process. Uh, so as has been mentioned, there was a proposal that came out uh, last year. There was a notice and comment process. Uh, the committee that I chair, the Standards Committee of the Council, uh, considered that feedback. We came out with a new proposal last week, November 4th. Um, I circulated it to the panel the next day uh, so that we've all had a chance to look at it. Uh, and you can be the judge. I'm going to talk about it a little later on, uh, what some of the changes are. But I think we've been responsive to a number of the, the concerns of the public and the law professors and other comments that we received. That's the point of the process. That's why we go through this. And all of you are invited into the process, not only to submit notice and comment, but like me, you could be somebody who volunteers to help out uh, at the section to go on a site visit, and you can be involved. Um, that's the beauty of, of uh, professional self-regulation. <laughs> uh, so this isn't some abstract bureaucracy in Washington that you're not able to reach. Uh, we as lawyers can actually have an impact on it. So I want to start out uh, to talk about diversity by mentioning three examples of a situation that a lawyer might confront in practice. Um, the first, uh, a black woman approaches you for estate planning. Uh, the key question that she has uh, is, why does she need a will? Why can't I just name my heirs as joint tenants uh, on her bank accounts and on her house? Um, as a lawyer, you explain to her the typical answers about why that's not a, a good idea, including that uh, your children's creditors then would be able to reach all your assets. Um, but as the conversation goes on, it's clear that she doesn't trust you. Um, she reveals a deep distrust of institutions like probate courts and banks uh, that are deeply rooted in experience that she and her parents have had uh, when she's been taken advantage of in the past. Um, as a result, she doesn't trust your advice. She walks out with no estate plan. Uh, and as a result, she'll be less able to effectively transfer her wealth to the next generation. Example number two, uh, you're preparing for a jury trial in a complex commercial matter uh, that on its face is completely unrelated to race. Uh, in fact, it's a contract matter where the issue fundamentally is whether or not the defendant was obligated to keep his promises. Um, tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake. Uh, you go through extensive preparation, including hiring a jury consultant. Uh, and after hearing your case, the jury consultant tells you that the district where the case is venued is likely to produce a significant number of minority jurors. He also says that the way that you're planning to tell your story right now is not likely to appeal to those jurors who may have a different view uh, of whether or not large companies are likely to keep their promises. As a result, he tells you you need to adjust your presentation to take into account the way that minority jurors are likely to perceive your case. And you spend the next few weeks reworking your trial outline and preparing your witnesses to implement what you've learned. Third example, uh, this client is a pro bono local nonprofit that owns low income housing in your community that is funded by US Department of Housing and Urban Development grants. Uh, financial issues unfortunately require the nonprofit to sell the housing, but it can only sell to another nonprofit that will uphold, uphold the terms of the grants. Your job is to make the case to potential buyers, a job that requires you to explain the need for low income housing. Uh, and that in turn requires you to understand the racially discriminatory patterns of housing that have existed in your community dating back to before World War II. So, what do all three of these examples have in common? Actually, they're all things that have happened to me in the last four years as a general practitioner in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Uh, not a place that is particularly known for its racial strife uh, or racist history. Uh, and there's dozen, dozens of others uh, of instances like that I could list, and I imagine lawyers from all over the country could give you similar stories. Uh, all of these examples demonstrate why a minimally competent lawyer must have a basic understanding of race and the impact that it has on our society. Uh, it influences whether or not you as a lawyer are going to be able to be effective uh, in achieving the goals of your client. Now, why do I say minimally competent? Uh, well, that's really the goal of the accreditation process, to set minimum standards for law schools and to make sure that they're producing lawyers that are minimally competent to be able to function in our society. Uh, this, in fact, is the goal of the proposed changes to standard 303 that have been discussed. Uh, the standard says that students must be given education at least twice during their law school experience. And they don't have to be full courses, by the way. They can just be uh, a, a lecture or a session. But twice, education on bias, cross-cultural competence, and racism. 
Now, interpretation 3038 of the proposal specifies that we are not prescribing the former content of this education. Of this education. That's not the role of the accreditor. Uh, we're just requiring that you talk about this uh, on the theory that if you're going to be a lawyer in a society, you have to have some understanding of these issues. Now, just as the Federalist Society, as we heard in the introduction to this talk, can sponsor CLE that gets you a diversity credit uh, uh, in various states, so too can law schools approach these topics from a conservative perspective if they wish. There's no prescription one way or the other. Uh, and in fact, contrary to what Professor McGinnis says, the standards do protect academic freedom in standard 405. Law schools are actually required to have a policy of academic freedom that allows teaching from all ideological perspectives. Um, second, it's also the goal of the proposed changes to standard 206. Uh, one of the, the changes that was a response to the comments is that the preamble now says that the goal of the new standard is to achieve the effective educational use of diversity, um, which ties it directly to this purpose of un lawyers understanding the context in which they will be practicing, um, uh, including particularly uh, 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 giving them uh, other teachers who are from different minority groups so they can understand different perspectives. Um, now, this is based on the conviction that law schools will not be as effective at teaching the skills a lawyer needs to confront the scenarios that I outlined above if it doesn't include members of underrepresented groups who are able to represent those perspectives from a firsthand uh, basis. Now, I want to stress that the philosophical basis, at least in my mind, uh, for why the council is undertaking these things is not because we want to Im impose wokeness or critical race theory on the law schools. Um, it's not a radical leftist agenda, which I don't think would be appropriate for an accreditor to undertake. Uh, instead, I see these things as coming in from, from what I would call a Burkean conservative perspective, uh, which can be summed up in two words, summed up in two words, which is that culture matters. Um, navigating the world requires a nuanced understanding of circumstances, including the history of race in our country, and not the blind application of ideology. Uh, and this, in turn, requires an exposure to a variety of ideas and a variety of backgrounds so that we can fully understand the culture in which we will be operating as lawyers. Law schools that don't provide this uh, are not serving their students well, uh, and they are not serving the public well either. Now, of course, some law schools are and will continue to teach critical race theory. Uh, there are a number of leftists uh, in American law schools. Um, that's probably unavoidable, and it would not be the ABA's place to ban that any more than the ABA would be able to prescribe it. Um, but I do think that it's important that the accreditation standards carve out a space for law schools that do not subscribe to the reigning orthodoxy of the day. Uh, and we do that in the new standards in at least three ways, or four ways, actually. First, as uh, interpretation 3036, which interprets the requirement to, to provide training on bias and cultural competency, again, says that we're not prescribing the content of that education. That's up to law schools. Standard 206, uh, when it requires an inclusive and equitable environment with respect to under certain underrepresented groups, specifies uh, that that rule does not require law schools to censure the academic discussion of ideas that may be offensive to some. To the contrary, standard 405 protects academic freedom. And I think law schools would get in trouble if they started censuring speech in the classroom with which they politically disagreed. Uh, new interpretation 206.4 also says that to the extent the standard requires a religiously affiliated law school to provide an environment that's inclusive and equitable with respect to sexual orientation or gender identity, the school need not act contrary to its religious beliefs, as long as those actions are protected by the US Constitution. And finally, Interpretation 206.5 says that if there is a state constitution or other law that prohibits the consideration of race or ethnicity uh, in hiring, that the law school is not required to violate that law. Um, now, I want to respond briefly to Professor McGinnis's comment about the need for ideological diversity in law schools. Uh, I support that goal. Uh, I think it's one of the main goals of the Federalist Society, and I think it's a wonderful thing when law schools are filled with diverse political perspectives. But I think it's dangerous to have an accreditor making ideological judgments about uh, who is sufficiently conservative to check the quota of conservatives that the law school needs to be accredited. Uh, for example, does Akhil Amar or Amy Chua qualify? Um, these are difficult questions, and, and if you get a, an accreditor in the business of making ideological judgments, I think it could be very dangerous where that might end. Uh, an accreditor can't mandate ideological diversity. What it can do, again, is protect academic freedom, that's standard 405, and it can also carve out a space for accredited law schools that, again, dissent from the prevailing view. So, for example, Ave Maria Law School, accredited by the ABA. George Mason Law School, accredited by the ABA. Regent, 
accredited by the ABA, Faulkner, Brigham Young, and there's a number of other law schools that generally have a conservative perspective and have a large number of conservatives on their faculty. Uh, they're allowed to exist under the current standards and they will continue to be allowed to exist under the current standards. Um, I also, <laughs> if it were up to me at least. Uh, <laughs> I also want to uh, respond to the point about uh, the danger of imposing wokeism in law school and what the meaning of inclusion and equity means. There actually is an interpretation of the standard that says what kind of actions a law school might take to promote inclusion and equity. Among them is not suppressing the speech of others. It's not there. Uh, and that's not the goal. Again, that's protected under standard 405. Uh, instead, that standard is about providing support for underrepresented students who, for example, may be the first generation of their family to attend college or, or law school. What sort of additional support might they need? Uh, that's the kind of question we want law schools to be ask, asking. It's also about teaching civility, which I think is crucial to the legal profession, uh, where we can disagree on fundamental and important questions uh, without attacking each other personally or doing it in a way that makes others turn off the conversation because they feel threatened. Um, students have to be introduced to this tradition, and it's the role of law schools to be able to inculcate those values um, so that the next generation will be as uh, capable of civil debate as I hope we're demonstrating on this panel. Um, a final point about the ABA's role in accreditation. Um, judicial independence is an extremely important value in our society. It's, it's part of the separation of powers. It's one of the ways that we keep our government in check. Right? And you can't have judicial independence if the very government that you're trying to keep in check is the entity that describes who should be allowed to be a lawyer and be allowed to access the courts. Um, as a result, it's crucial that we have an independent body, not the legislature, not Congress, not an agency in Washington, that is deciding who can and cannot become a lawyer. That's why the ABA has been in this business uh, for almost 100 years now, uh, and it's why the ABA, I think, should continue to be in this business on into the future. Thank you. Okay, we are running a little bit behind, but I do want to give all the panel members a couple of minutes to respond to anything they've heard. So let's, let's aim for two minutes uh, per panelist, but go ahead, Professor Morgan. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I, I think it's important to stress that in at least uh, three areas, uh, at least I believe, the panel is largely in agreement. First, there has been no dispute about the ABA standards for equal opportunity in education. Uh, that, uh, at some periods in our history, would have been a, uh, a fight. But everybody recognizes, I think, uh, that the idea that individuals should be welcome in the legal profession, uh, whatever their background or makeup, is uh, an important value that uh, we all respect. Second uh, is the idea that everybody largely agrees that diversity as a concept is important. That is to say, we are a diverse society. And there is value in having uh, diversity uh, throughout the institutions of the society uh, so that people uh, uh, do have confidence uh, in their, their institutions. Third, uh, I agree with uh, Daniel Thies that uh, cultural sensitivity is an important value uh, and is a, uh, a part of being a uh, responsible lawyer. What I think that the ABA has left out and may even some of them may misunderstand is that law schools operate in markets all the time. You don't get to dictate what the percentage of your um, black students are going to be. You have to find them and recruit them uh, in order to get them to come to your school. In short, uh, and I'm use, uh, just trying to move more quickly here, you have to do your best, and you have to convince the accreditors that you're doing your best. But what the ABA has set up in their proposal, even the new one, Daniel, is the burden of proof on the law school and then suggestions of safe harbors, which amount to 
very detailed surveys of very personal attitudes and information about uh, all sorts of uh, characteristics. And that's where you go astray. The proposals for years have required efforts in this area. And that we used, to, when we did the, the visits, we would interview faculty and administrators and everybody else involved in the question of whether or not you are seeking to develop a more diverse uh, faculty and student body. But we recognize that in a real world environment, you can't make the numbers come out right year after year. And if your accreditation turns on it, then you get too much focus on meeting those numbers instead of all the other things you have to do to build a quality law school and ultimately a quality legal education. We respect you, we respect all the efforts that you're putting in in a very complex uh, environment <coughs> to develop these uh, standards, but I think there is work left to be done. Justice Bales. So I, I, th I think Professor Morgan does make an important point on the agreement as to ultimate goals. And, and certainly with respect to 205 and 206, those are standards that have been in place. And indeed, some of the changes in 206 reflect um, a response to schools that were asking for more clarity in, the, in guidance. And um, we certainly can debate over whether the changes do in the most effective way um, help us achieve perhaps shared goals. I can't resist wanting to respond briefly on 303 and the comments by Yale professors about how they relate or do not relate to practice skills. I, as a Harvard graduate, I never thought of Yale as a place where a person went to learn how to practice. Um, I, I mean, I always thought that was the ethereal law school. Um, but let me just mention three things quickly. And again, 303, the new standard directs that there be some education on issues of bias, cross-cultural competence, and racism. On bias, the rules of um, the Model Code of Judicial Conduct says that judges shall not manifest bias or prejudice, and they shall not allow lawyers appearing before them to do so. That, to me, is it's a core element now of professional competency. In terms of cultural competency, that's something that's long been practiced by law enforcement, in the healthcare professions, by the military. And I know as a prosecutor in Arizona, I could not have effectively prosecuted violent crimes off our Indian reservations without some sensitivity in terms of cultural competency. Things like whether you firmly shake a person's hand or look them in the eye mean very different things in that cultural context than it might have meant from the cultural context I came from. And finally, as to racism, I, I noticed this summer when Justice Alito wrote the majority opinion in the voting rights case Brnovich versus DNC, he observed that the, the history of racially discriminatory denial of voting rights that was the backdrop to things like the Voting Rights Act is something that all Americans should remember. Certainly, it's something that all lawyers should remember if we're truly committed to upholding the ideals of our Constitution. John? Uh, so uh, let me just uh, begin by saying that I actually don't think the best idea is for uh, uh, any accreditor to impose ideological diversity. The difficulty with these standards, though, is that they're going to reduce ideological diversity as even uh, a study by Harvard and Chicago law professors suggests that that focus is in tension with that. And I think the reason that ideological diversity is important to think about is to recognize how these standards will work. There's a connection between the rules that are given and those who are carrying them out. And my largest concern is not only the, the vagueness, I think, of the rules and the use of the word equity and inclusion, uh, but the reality that those words are going to be interpreted in a very uh, left-wing uh, institutions and used uh, to make them even more, uh, to create even a greater pall of orthodoxy. So the way I think of this is that we already have a lot of ideological distortions. 
uh, at law schools, primarily because there is so, so, such, so, so little uh, uh, ideological diversity, and, this, and that's, the, that's the Kindle. And these standards are little sparks that create even more fire uh, there. So in a world where we had extremely ideologically diverse uh, law schools, uh, maybe these standards wouldn't be as problematic as they are. But that's why I think it's important to understand the interaction between these standards and the law faculties that we have and how they will be used uh, to create a, a more uh, woke education, relied on in that respect. And indeed, uh, people will, will, will openly say, well, the accreditations, why, why get in any trouble with the accreditation standard? Let's go farther in this respect. And the other, only other point I just emphasize is that I don't think the standards take seriously enough the fact that there is a large debate about uh, where, it's not a question of wh where, uh, whether we should admit completely uh, on every, uh, with every uh, standard of non-discrimination, people from all ethnic groups, but the question is what degree of preference to give different groups. And that is a deep, deep question uh, of well, about, not about actually even how to advance diversity. I don't think these standards, and particularly how they will be applied on the ground, uh, take sufficient account of that. And that, I think, is, is perhaps the greatest tragedy uh, because I fear I'm someone who's somewhat sympathetic to the mismatch hypothesis that it actually will be harmful in the long run to diversifying the profession. Daniel, you've, you've had a little bit of rebuttal so far, yeah. but just briefly, if you have anything uh, sure, else. Sure, yeah, there's plenty to talk about here for sure. Um, so I think it's useful to point out in response to, to some of the comments that uh, there are really two animating principles behind the standards uh, as expressed in these proposals. One is the idea that we should be focused on outcomes and not inputs. So if you know the history of this process, the, the standards used to be littered with you know, a certain number of volumes you needed to have in, in your library and you know, various input measures of things that we were prescribing. We've now moved to an outcome standard uh, where uh, the idea is you, you say more generally what the goals are and give law schools flexibility to achieve that. That's what we've tried to accomplish here by not being too prescriptive about how you promote diversity, but saying that it's something that law schools should care about. The other factor is, of course, that we, we want to avoid quotas. Uh, and, and I think it's important to note that the revised proposal uh, took out some language that there was some concern that it did prescribe quotas. Um, but I think the new standard is clear that the results that we're looking for here are not just a certain number of minorities. We're talking about effective educational use of diversity. So the point is what's going on in the classroom? How are lawyers being trained? And that's the focus of the standard, not quotas. Uh, and the last point to respond to Professor McGinnis, um, I totally get the concern that law faculty are going to take the standards and run with them to promote whatever ideological goal they might want to promote. That's what lawyers do. We take the, the tools that we're given. The solution to that, though, is transparency and guidance from the ABA. And we've been trying to achieve that in recent years through managing directors' memos about what various standards mean, educational programs where we talk to faculty and deans and explain what's required. More of that is necessary, and I think we need to do a better job of that. So let me just ask you. Let me give you a hypothetical picking up on John's point about how this environment, inclusive environment standard is going to interact in the real world, in the law schools as they are. So what would you say to a situation where a, a diversity officer takes the position that membership in the Federalist Society is triggering and uses that as a basis to threaten their law license and harass them and such? And that is actually going on right now at a very major law school that's well represented yeah. here. I think the, the Federalist Society is w about academic discussion of ideas. Uh, and the new standards as proposed say that law schools are not required to censure or prohibit the academic discussion of ideas. So absolutely, I think that would be very problematic if a diversity officer is saying that. There's nothing in the standards that require that. Again, a, uh, academic freedom is protected, and I think there would be an argument that the school would be in danger of violating 405 if it went down that road and excluded an entire ideological group from campus. Okay, let's, um, let's go to questions. We don't have a lot of time, but we'll try to do as many as we can. Please. So I, I have a question uh, about minimum standards, and there's, the panel is very Harvardy, so let's use a Harvard example. There's 182 full-time faculty at Harvard Law. Five, by my count, are conservative, you know, give or take five or six. And my worry is not with the conservative students uh, in the classroom. They know both sides of the arguments. It's about the kind of the soft liberal students. They're never taught the other side. 
is this a problem for being critical thinkers, for being a lawyer that's able to represent multiple positions? Are we, are we not equipping, it's, it's kind of odd to think about it as a Fed talk conference, but are we being uh, bad stewards of the faculty for those people who are conservatives, who aren't being exposed to different ideas? And so, you know, Mr. Thies or Justice Bales, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, <laughs> I have to, it's hard not to talk from one's own experience. When I, when I was at Harvard, it was in the midst of the controversies about critical legal studies. Um, and you probably could have at that time said that the number of conservative professors was as few as, as it was today. But as I said, Paul Bator was one of my mentors. My third year paper advisor was a guy named Douglas Ginsburg. I edited a law review article by someone named Charles Freed. So there are certainly perspectives of, of conservative voices in the school. And after all, you know, we are talking about adults. I, my experience, law students aren't, you know, they're fairly quickly uh, independent minded and they have access to a diversity of views. I, I, I share the concerns that Daniel Thies voiced about if, if the accreditors were to try to control diversity. And um, you know, I think if you look across American law schools, I, I get the view that, look, you take polls and most professors are uh, on the left side of their politics. But I think within schools, uh, there is still a diversity of perf perspectives. And I don't think students are, are denied an opportunity to hear per a, a variety of views. Um, if I were a dean, I'd want to ensure that I did have a faculty with uh, differing views, and I'd hope that there would be a way that students in the course of their careers would be exposed to different perspectives and, and taught to think critically themselves. And I think that's one of the most important things that a law school education provides, that you, you think critically and you engage others civilly in trying to come to um, your own reasoned views. Next question. Um, yes, uh, my name is James Dimmer. I'm a student yeah, at or? George Washington. Oh, in the back? Oh, he can go. I, I, I can't see. Sorry. Do we have two mics? We have two. Yeah. Okay. Next question from okay. the back. Sorry about that. Yeah, a uh, really quick question. I, it was discussed earlier that uh, one of the proposals is to have some um, measuring performance uh, among different uh, eth you know, demographic backgrounds. Uh, is there a disclosure requirement? to say how certain groups are performing in terms of in their class. And let me just give you where this question's coming from. Uh, people in this room might be familiar. I'm a Georgetown alum. Um, there was recently a situation where there was a, uh, professors were having a discussion on a Zoom call. One of the professors made the comment, to her chagrin, she wasn't uh, boasting about it, but she said, you know, I have, you know, uh, some African-American students in my class, they, they, they perform well in class, but when the grades come out, they're towards the bottom of the class. That created an uproar. There was a letter that came from the dean. Um, I thought it was quite actually embarrassing because it starts bringing concepts of bystander liability because the other person on the, on the uh, phone call, uh, what, what wound up happening is, I think both professors wound up, one got fired, one left, and it's not me to defend liberal professors getting hoisted on their own petard, but that happened. And um, the one thing that wasn't in the letter was, is there any objective statistics that the dean could share to show how students are performing at the law school? And uh, no one wanted to touch that one, so. Yeah, so there's a couple things there. Um, I think that the language that was referenced about um, looking at academic and outcomes uh, and so forth was removed from the latest proposal. What is in the, the latest proposal uh, is a requirement that law schools report in what's called the annual questionnaire uh, data uh, that the council requires that reflects their performance uh, in satisfying the diversity standards. So th there is a set of data that the, that the ABA requires. It includes uh, ethnic and racial data of students. Um, and uh, also of outcomes. Now in, in terms of, uh, and outcomes in the sense of who, pass, who graduates and who passes the bar as measured by race. So yes, absolutely, if there's a school that, where lots of uh, African American students are matriculating but not graduating or graduating and not passing the bar, that could be very much a problem with the standard. Um, in, in terms of making it public, uh, I think that's a discussion that's ongoing among the council. Um, there has been a decision recently to release bar pass data uh, aggregated across the country by race and ethnicity. Uh, and, and I think there's been discussion also of doing that on a school by school basis, but that there continues to be discussion on that point. From the front. 
Okay, sorry, I'll try this again. Um, so my question, uh, so I find it a little problematic um, that we're equating race with what I think are class issues. I, I think if you go into any poor white neighborhood, basically in America, you'll be able to find people who aren't friends of banks or corporations. Um, speaking of myself, I grew up homeless. <laughs> um, I, my, we often didn't have electricity, and then I ran away when I was 16 and spent the next five or six years on the street. Um, so I'm just curious why someone who might have a darker complexion than me that grew up relatively wealthy um, and agrees with 95% of what 80% of the law school class would agree with would have more diversity than you know a conservative, very, very poor student like myself. Thank you. Well, so uh, the revised proposal, I think it's worth pointing out, uh, and the, the language on students says, a law school shall ensure the effective educational use of diversity by providing full access to the study of law and admission to the profession to all persons. All persons, right? Same language as the Constitution. So that would include uh, race, class, you know, all sorts of differences. All persons need to have full access to law school. Uh, and it goes on then and says, particularly members of underrepresented groups related to race and ethnicity. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate about whether or not there should be a focus on those two groups. But I think uh, what's carried the day in the debate so far is th that there is a unique uh, history of historical injustices when it comes to race and ethnicity in this country. Uh, and the standard is meant to, to take account of that and to say that th those groups require some particular attention, but not to the exclusion of other uh, diverse categories, rather based on class or otherwise. Professor Morgan. Uh, just quickly, that's part, that question illustrates part of the real problem that schools are facing. There are trade-offs all the time uh, as to how you, uh, and, and the problem of how you make decisions among very valuable objectives. Uh, you can't meet them all with the resources you have. There really are decisions that have to be made. And uh, I just suggest, and I don't mean it's easy, uh, that uh, you need to make clear, uh, Daniel, what, what the uh, uh, opportunity schools have are to meet these uh, important objectives. We are almost out of time, but let's try to squeeze in one more from the back. Sure. Uh, Mr. Thies, you expressed a concern about uh, judging whether someone's conservative enough, like you don't want to like be in that business, but why aren't you concerned about sort of judging, you know, like, am I black enough to bring whatever perspectives I, as a black person, am supposed to, like, bring if I'm going to be a faculty member? Yeah. Mm. Well, so I think we do have a long history of measuring that in our country. Um, imperfect, uh, to be sure, but the Department of Education has collected racial and ethnicity data uh, for a long time. The ABA uses their categories. Um, and they allow students and faculty to identify which racial category or categories they fall into. Uh, and admittedly, that's an imperfect measure. Um, uh, it may not capture everybody uh, the way they want to be captured, but it is a way of getting some data on this point that I think can be useful for the purposes that we've talked about. But can I just uh, Go ahead, John. You say it's an imperfect history. And of course, the, the point is some people think it's a, it's a dreadful history, right, that <laughs> we've been doing this, and the, the, ar the argument for Color blindness is actually, of course, that by getting away from looking at these considerations, we're actually going not to uh, perpetuate that history. Now, I understand their responses on the other side that we need to look at this history to get beyond it, that as we, can, we, we can quote different uh, Supreme Court justices, but I don't understand why it's the role of the accreditor to make those kinds of very difficult ideologically fraught decisions. We could have a debate about that, but it's, this doesn't seem to be the central issue. It doesn't seem to be the central or even the responsibility of an accreditor to make those decisions rather than allowing them for different law schools to make those decisions. We'll see what, who has the better atmosphere in the, in the law school, who actually has an atmosphere where people are treated without regard to the, uh, the color of their skin. There's real tensions, and I speak from experience, of having a law school where people have a consciousness that some people are admitted because, or, or with different standards, and that creates a real tensions 
within uh, a, a law school and does not, I think, ultimately promote a, a society in which people deal with one another as individuals. And that's the, that's the debate, and it's a great debate to have politically, but I don't think it's a debate to have or, or, or for the accreditor to put one thumb on, on, on the side of one side of that debate. Um, it it is now 12.31, which means we're a minute over time. It is time for the Rosencrantz debate. I'm sorry to the folks in line, uh, but please join me in thanking the panelists for an excellent discussion.